day to day, what do you wake up in the morning and think? You should think, what would I do today if I was to start my business from scratch? <laughs> if I could change everything, what would I do differently? And that's what I kind of try and say to my team is don't just become entrenched in we've done that before, it works, so we'll do it again. You know, to constantly ask yourself, but why? Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that builds employees and customers love and support. Thanks to BizSimply for sponsoring this episode of our show partner. BizSimply is the all-in-one HR workforce management road and operation software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, how we grow our businesses, and how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long term, not just survive. In this week's episode, I am very excited to be joined by the amazing Perry Hayden Taylor, who's the founder of Big Fish, which helped challenger brands to start, transform, and grow. They only work with businesses that share their values and strive to be a force of good in the world. And we dive into why company leaders has to be part of solving the emerging problem around climate change. Perry says we need to unfuck the planet and we can do that by being more conscious about where we are putting our money. We should be focusing on spending and investing money in companies that is a force for good. And Perry shares how Big Fish works with their clients. We talk about some of the amazing challenge brands they have and are working with, like Whole Earth, Charlie Bickham, Dorset Cereal, and many others. We also talk about Adam Morgan's book, Eating Big Fish, and how Challenger's brand can compete with big businesses. And Perry says, to be a Challenger brand, you need to have a very bold vision, be obsessive about continuous improvement, obsessive about the product, and lots of passion and purpose. Perry shares some great business and brand advice during this conversation. He also gives his view on the future of hospitality, how things are changing due to the way we work and consume food on the go. And we also discuss what the role of food will be. And it must be to bring more health to people and less impact to the planet. Along the way, we visit many other themes. Being a force for good in business, adapt a startup mentality, how to stay relevant as a brand, how to show up pro as a leader, company culture, and much, much more. But before you tune in, please sign up for our weekly newsletter at hospitalitymavericks.com, packed with more Maverick insights, strategies, and tools. Now, please grab notebook, pen, and coffee, and let's get started. Today, we'll be talking about how you build a brand, but not just, you know, any kind of cookie cutter brand, but how you build a maverick brand that not only gives business sense, but also makes a positive impact on their people, their communities, and the planet. And we have a real brand maverick here as a guest. It's Perry Hayden Taylor, the founder of Big Fish, which is an award-winning brand design and marketing consultancy working with some of the most loved food and drinks brands such as Hola, Charlie Bickham, Dorset Cereal, Tight Ford Organic, Yo Valley, and many, many others. We'll probably touch on some of them in the conversation. But first of most, welcome to the show, Perry. Thank you, Michael. That's incredibly kind of you to have me on. Um, very exciting. I can't wait to uh, be interrogated by you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had had a, a number of conversations prior to, uh, to to the interview. And, and therefore, when I sent you the question, you, you said, oh, well, that, that, that's a lot of questions there, Michael. But they all, they're all very important because I think we, we the, the agenda today here is uh, not just talking about how you build a maverick brand, but also how you actually make some, some positive impact on the world. I've been, we had a couple of conversations prior to this. I also have checked you out and seen what you've been talking about before. And there's like, a, you know, there's something that comes up every time is that you talk about, you know, we need to unfuck the planet. So, so why do we need to unfuck the planet, Perry? What's happening? Well, I'm a 54 year old, so I have many sins uh, that I have to repay or pay for. Um, and I think, you know, if anybody can walk outside and not be bombarded by messages of doom and gloom 
then uh, they haven't been living in the real world. So there's no doubt that, it, yes, great, everyone's done a great job. Extinction Rebellion have done a fantastic job of raising awareness uh, of all the problems. But actually, what we need is people to actually do something about them. And I'm actually an incredibly positive person. And um, my now 18-year-old daughter basically has held me to account for the last few years saying, but daddy, you know, what are you actually going to do differently? You know, you love talking about this stuff and you're running around telling everyone that there's lots of problems, but what are you actually going to do? And I think it might have been her or somebody, I think pretty sure it was Peps, brought me, said, pointed out a quote, which was an Einstein quote, which said that, uh, I think it said, the world will not be destroyed by those who do the evil, but only by those who watch them get away with it or watch them doing it and don't do anything about it. It's something like that. And... And I think she's absolutely right. I think we all have a duty to to actually to to, to do something. And if we don't, um, then the you know, the, the future is looking pretty bleak. So yeah, I believe life is precious and should be conserved at every level. And as a fifty four year old man, I want to look back in the next twenty five years and feel that I left the planet in a better place, you know, than than, than when I arrived. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I agree with you. A lot of people have actually talked about what there is a problem but i think we are at the, the the critical crossroad now we actually need to do something everybody has to to take their part and do their little little thing everything matters here but if you uh, i know that when you you share things on linkedin uh, perry you are very you know you share great insights but also documentaries people should see and some of these documentaries they are like horror movies in my view uh, because i'm a very big fan of protecting the planet because that's the most precious we have and that's one of the things i can leave to, to my children as well but if you would say there's one documentary people should see to to understand this issue we have around climate change which one should that be well it's difficult i mean look there are a lot of documentaries and the reason that i promote things on my linkedin is because it's about the only platform i have where very few people actually follow me but anyway at least hopefully some of them have influence and i think that one of the most important things in the climate emergency is actually education and educating people because if people know and people human beings generally want to do the right thing i don't think anyone wakes up in the morning and thinks you know i want to do harm to the planet um and so the more that people understand i think the more people will be prepared to change their behaviors so whether you look at a documentary you know that's quite an extreme one perhaps it may have some levels of over dramatization like cowspiracy which which was you know done a, a long time ago now um to sort of raise the alarm on uh the the, the plight of, of of the meat industry or i think that there's uh i can't actually remember the name of it was it the, the biggest little farm a fantastic fantastic documentary uh, which was again, you know, beautifully dramatized, but to taught people so many lessons about biodiversity, about the importance of all of the, the, you know, the soil and all of those things. Those are great films. But the one that's really front of mind right now is something that just threw me into a flat spin, which is Seaspiracy, and it's only just come out. And I don't know if you've watched it, but it is a horror movie. But I think everybody should watch it. Anybody who eats fish should watch that film before they eat fish again. Um, I grew up on an island in Jersey and fish, you know, is part of my everyday diet. I love fish. I love seafood, etc. But I had no idea what was been going on in the fishing industry. Um, the headlines of that seaspiracy are, let's give you a few, that our oceans will be empty by 2048, that there are that there are four and a half million commercial fishing vessels destroying our oceans faster than the rainforest. Bycatch kills 50 million sharks and over 350,000 dolphins every year as a result of trawlers. So, you know, I had no idea. And then the thing that really, I mean, the, the other thing that threw me was that the fact that um, nearly 50% of all the plastic in the great garbage patch has come from fishing nets. Um, you know, so so I had no idea, you know, and I've I've worked innocently uh, with, you know, businesses that I know have no intention of damaging the planet. Uh, but the but the unintended consequences of the fishing industry are really scary. 
at the moment. And so, you know, I think one of our mottos is question everything. And now we need to question um, the, the fishing industry. Yeah, it's a really rough, rough movie. I actually had to to turn it off at some point uh, because if it got our oh, fast forward, uh, it was like yeah, it was really you know the depressing because uh, we all knew probably there is an issue around fishing and overfishing. Uh, one of my friends created a campaign. Uh, he's he's called Carl. It's called the Fish Love Campaign. He runs a restaurant called Mashimo. Uh, very very funny actually, a, a sushi restaurant. Uh, so fish is a is a part of it, and and he is a very big advocate for stop overfishing in the the ocean and did this great fish love campaign with you know dame judy dance richard brands a lot of famous people around the globe standing stay 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 standing naked with fish in front of them um <laughs> Brilliant. and they're just a little restaurant doing their impact but they raised that about five years ago um uh, so I knew there were some issues, but when I thought that, I also saw the, the scale of the people involved and the evil that's involved in this and how this actually can, you know, really destroy our, you know, your climate or biodynamic climate. This is like, you know, this is like, a, you know, this is something we need to take action on now as industries, as individuals. We really need to ask questions about where our food comes from and uh, and how it's been treated. And I think, by the way, just to build on this, which is that, it's all about education because, as I said, I think you know, 99.99% of human beings are good. We all wake up in the morning and we want to make something good happen, um, some more than others. And, um, for example, I, I have friends uh, and family in the investment industry, you know, in the finance industry. And I've been asking them, have you watched this Netflix film? You know, And not, none of them have sort of even thought about it. And I've been talking about... Uh, you know, ESG, environmental social governance investment with them and saying, you know, are you aware of the sort of consequences of where we're putting our money? For example, you know, pensions, take, let's take pensions. Um, and I think there, there needs to be a big, big film on this as well. I would love to do a documentary if I was a documentary maker uh, about our pensions and where our money is going, because we can control where our money goes. We, everybody can say where they put their money. And, and and actually, businesses that want to be a force for good will desperately crave people's money, you know, whether they're looking for raising cash on the stock market, et cetera. Uh, and you know, they do already. But, but, but if, if they suddenly find out that consumers and people, investors are saying, well, actually, you know, I don't want to put my money into industries where I know they're doing harm, this is where we can make the biggest change. And, and I've been talking to, for example, my brother who works for a, an investment fund. I said to him, you know, have you got a, a, an ethical, you know, a sustainable investment um, division? And he said, no, we haven't. There isn't a demand for it. And I said, well, that's just shocking, isn't it? Because, you know, we need to wake people up to this. And he agreed. He said, I just, you know, it's just it's not something that's, uh, that's ever present. So I think, you know, the, the point about these films is that they get through, they only need to get through to, you know, a few people who can make a massive difference. Um, and I think that that's what's so amazing. So to put a positive spin on it, although it is a horror film, and there are many horror films, and, and yes, I'm sure that they are, they could be accused of misrepresenting some of the facts, etc. Ultimately, there's no smoke without fire. And it's good to be able to hold industry's feet to the fire and start, start you know, saying, look, we're all accountable. Us as consumers, you know, providers, supply chain, uh, anybody in the supply chain, but also investors. You know, we've all got to make a difference. So that's why I sort of spend my life on LinkedIn, trying to hopefully ram home that message, which I believe is going to make a significant difference. How, how is that then uh, connected, Perry, with the things you do in your business? Your daughter have told you something needs to happen. What, <laughs> how are you approaching, you know, because you're a brand agency and work with, with a number of brands, but how is that actually, you know, the, saving the, the planet actually connected with Big Fish? Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because um, many years ago, 27 years ago, when we started Big Fish, which is, you know, it started out literally just as a, a brand design and, and a very basic marketing company. And we would set out to advise clients and, and help them uh, start and, you know, grow businesses, mainly entrepreneurs. But over, over a quarter of a century, our role has become more systemic uh, and in, in in terms of their commercial strategies, uh, not all of them, but many of the brands that we've worked with, we've become deeply ingrained and deeply immersed in their businesses at a board level. 
And so a lot of the decisions that are being made today, you know, are consumer centric, but they're also uh, sustainability centric. You know, so so we have become more and more ingrained, uh, more entrenched in the decision making aspects of the businesses deeper, deeper down into their commercial models. And what's interesting is that um, if you look at brands today, brands that are successful, the really successful ones, you know, they have very strong philosophies, very strong values, um, and that they are accountable and they're prepared to, you know, uh, to think again to what I call have a, you know, maintain or adopt a startup mentality where they adapt. I mean, if you look at the great sort of classics like Blackberry, I suppose, for example, which is one of the most famous stories. And, you know, what a wonderful invention that was. The obsession of many millions of people. Um, suddenly it got wiped out because it, it wasn't agile. It didn't adapt. Along came the iPhone with no buttons, you know, and, and it just wiped out the Blackberry in space of a couple of years. And so where we as a business have become, I think, most valuable is is in the thinking and helping our clients think about the opportunities and the challenges that they have in their businesses. Um, and we are able to influence their decisions right through to the choices they make about their supply chains and about the way they treat their people. Um, and so, you know, there are four areas that we help in. One is, is systemic, strategic uh, thinking, both commercial and, and brand. The other is in their relationship with their consumer and how they can forge a direct relationship with their consumer. Uh, I think the third is in um, their culture and and actually brands thrive on great cultures. And I, you asked me a question about this, which I think comes up later on. Um, and the fourth is about the impact that they they have. Um, you know, what, what what impact are they having now? Is it negative? Is it positive? And what can they do to change that? And that's what, what what we're really focusing on these days. And did I ever think that that would be the case 20 years ago? No, I didn't. But I think businesses like ours have to become more, you know, more challenging towards our clients and, and help our clients make difficult decisions and adapt to a very, very uncertain and ever-changing environment. So, yeah, do, do I run the same business that I ran 10 years ago? No, it's completely different. But, but we ourselves are adapting. So I think um, the answer to your question being rather fuzzy there uh, is that we can make a difference by helping you know, owners of businesses make better decisions and better informed decisions and, and also challenge them to think differently and to, to perhaps think again about some of the things that they've been doing for many years that may or may not have had consequences that they were aware or were or weren't aware of, if that makes sense. Totally makes sense. It's about, you know, also uh, trying to, to, to educate and influence uh, brands to, to, to see the, the bigger picture of challenges. But what, what I really like about, uh, about you guys and when I've listened to and talked with you, like many of your 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 customers have been with you for years and uh you know one of one of my one of the brands you 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 work with a number of them but especially one of whole earth is a, a staple in our cupboard here in this <laughs> house you know that, that 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 everybody eats that more than once a day uh and and, and it's such a great you know uh such a great uh, story and brand and uh, such a great story and your Yo valley is another one but w- what is it that why is it that you because normally uh, i don't know if maybe i'm wrong maybe it's my insight but i always felt when i been working with brand agencies before it's almost like almost like a transactional relationship it goes a couple of years and then there's a change you know three to four <laughs> years and there's a change and i'm just talking out from my, my mcdonald's experience nothing else um but you you work for 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 decades with some of these brands charlie bickham is one of them as well yes we're very lucky i mean yeah i mean uh, i mean i i sort of i'm terrible uh when it comes to my team always give me a very hard time because i'm quite self-deprecating about the work we do but I genuinely think we're only as good as our clients and we're very lucky to work with people like Charlie Bigham or uh, Wasanan, who are now called Ecotone, uh, for some amazing reason. I think our sort of vibe attracted our tribe, if that makes sense. And so we've been very, very careful about choosing who we work with, which sounds rather arrogant, actually, because we're bloody lucky to have any clients, frankly. Um, so I think... 
what's happened is is that over the years we forged re relationships with them that are as i said are more systemic than just you know servicing a small part of their business we, we've become helpful to them um, and we speak truth to power that's one of our big things which is always speak truth to power um we we you know we always say what we believe um but also we really do love the, the products and I work on all the businesses I work on. I think I consume all of them. <laughs> and, you know, we started businesses as well with some, some of our clients and have become shareholders in their businesses as well. So I think the relationship we have with them is definitely, it sounds like a cliche, but is we, we definitely treat them as partners, but we also feel very lucky to have them as clients. And, um, yeah, I think it's important to nurture those relationships. Um, I mean, obviously, we do get fired, <laughs> and you know, and some come to an end, um, and we outlive our usefulness. But, but I think the work that we do is more really being, you know, part of their brand team, um, and feeling. You know, one client said to me, Can't, "You know, you know our brand better than we do, for God's sake." And I said, "Well, you know, I, I bloody hope so, really, given that we've helped be part of that team for ten years." You know, so. Loyalty for me is exceptionally important. I believe loyalty is a great, it's something we should all look at and as a measure for success. Certainly brands should. You know, the whole point about a great brand is that people buy your products and then they come back and buy it again. Um, so I get very sad when we lose clients. It's, it's, it's like a sort of bad breaking up with a girlfriend, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's like, you know, when you find these special relationships or, you know, people for your teams, you, you just know that you can't easily replace that when you get the, the right people or the right customers, as I say, it's, it's, it's important. But uh, I guess, again, uh, how do you then de de determine what is right to work with? Because I guess any gig is as good as an, uh, another gig in a way, if you talk about from a cash point of view. But how, what is your criteria for, for, for working with people? And, uh, and I, I saw another thing on your website with a little beautiful video about that you you don't pitch for your work you know <laughs> that's not what you do you don't do proposals in principle we don't pitch for free no well we don't creatively pitch is what I'm saying. look i think you're great question um there are four things that i think are important in the relationship with any supplier or partnership the first of all is chemistry you know if you if you kick if you really get on that's great and we all get out of bed in the morning and want to go to work and have fun and be surrounded by people that you really respect, admire, and going to make you look good, you know, and, and have fun with. So chemistry is key. The second is, you know, do we actually have any capabilities that will help these people? Because quite often our clients are better than us, you know, more often than not, actually. That, you know, they know their businesses brilliantly. They don't need some idiot to come along and tell them what to do, you know. So we really need to be there with a, with a, with a capable hat on that says, look, we're here because we can do this stuff. We know it better than you guys and, or, or we can certainly help you. Um, I think the other thing is, is actually down to availability quite often, you know, you've got to just pick and choose and prioritize who you want to work with. It'd be great to work with all of these, with everybody. Um, but we've chosen not to scale our business exponentially and to remain quite small. So we're very lucky that we are in demand. So we get to pick and choose. Uh, and, 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 and that's what, that's a great privilege. And then the other thing is fee fit of sort of affordability. Um, you know, quite often we would love to work with a client, but we just simply can't, there isn't a, you know, financially viable relationship or sometimes it, it, it goes the other way, which is actually that we're too small, you know, or that we're not set up for working with, you know, a particular organization at the scale they need us to, although that's become less of an issue in the last sort of few years. Um, so, but the key thing for me, the number one question is, do we like them? Do they like us? Do they have a product that we absolutely believe in? And do we believe that they're going to, you know, that, that, that there's an opportunity for us to really help them succeed and, and, and either start, transform or grow into something even more significant by, by dint of having us on board. So it's mainly shared values and love of product. Great, great. We had the pandemic and in the industry, you know, I come from the, the restaurant and hospitality industry that has been, you know, you've already seen pre-pandemic, there's a lot of what I call faceless brands, um, which really is just some pretty, pretty paint and uh, a beautiful menu, but the quality of the product, the... Uh, the infrastructure, the values, the philosophy is not really there. It's just something that's written on a website. They are, they're dying. Uh, is the pandemic the last push for, for brands that's just like 
made up in a way and not really lived every day by you know a, a team or a founder is that the death of faceless brands because the consumer has become even more savvy well i think it's a it's a fascinating um expose isn't it of what a brand is um i i personally loathe meaningless brands i find you know it, it I suppose because I probably I'm in the industry and I feel that your you know any kind of hoodwinking consumers is is just poor poor show really. So I think the brands that are going to get found out are the ones whose products add no value, you know, or are just commoditized. And I, I suppose by faceless brands, it implies that there aren't any human beings behind it. <laughs> Um, but but if you if you think about it, you know who the, the, what what do people really value? You know, people really value phenomenal uh, customer service these days. You know, customer service is is where most people win because a lot of products that you sell, you, you know, that are sold these days, in and of themselves, are not different in any way. They're just the same thing sold by a different person. So. I think a lot of the brands that that don't really um, obsess around customer service are going to fail. That's what, you know, they're just going to basically try and compete on price and the margins will erode and ultimately there won't be a business there. They'll just be, you know, selling stuff at, 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 at knockdown prices and probably having to do it at a huge volume and, and they'll erode the value in those categories. Whereas the businesses that are actually adding value through customer service or thinking about the, the, the way in which their products are presented or, you know, really enhancing the consumer experience, I think those businesses will do very well. And I think in the pandemic, we've all seen different businesses go through the roof that you perhaps wouldn't have seen go through the roof. I, I heard about one the other day, which is a business I don't know well, actually, but I've tried, which is a business called All Plants, frozen uh, ready meals, vegan ready meals. And, um, you know, when I first saw that business, I thought, well, that's quite niche. You know, this was pre-pandemic. That's quite niche, isn't it? Um, you know, will that business really fly? Yeah, um, it's quite a small market. But I've heard that it's gone through the roof and it's an absolutely gangbusters business. You know, and people have really found that to be an incredibly useful service. And I suppose businesses like that, and 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 also our businesses that we're involved in, like Biscuiteers, for example, um, which is a food gift business. These direct to consumer businesses have thrived because suddenly people had loads of perceptions. I think that were barriers to entry. I think consumers thought, well, it's just not that easy to have stuff delivered to me, and what do you do if you want to return it? And you know, and and people have preconceptions, and I think those preconceptions have been broken down by brands delivering great services. Um, there's a business I've invested in called um, Food Trucks. Uh, it's called Tuck Trucks, sorry. And, and that's a really clever business, which has started in the pandemic. And again, I don't think, you know, is it a good time to start a business in a pandemic? Well, it seems to have been quite a good time. And Tuck Trucks is an amazing service, which they provide food trucks that go outside, um, you know, park outside a pub, for example. You can uh, and you can you don't have to have a kitchen and you don't have to have a chef. You can just you know say actually I'm going to book tuck trucks to be outside my pub and they're going to do the food and you have an arrangement with them. And I just think that's an incredibly clever idea of organising food trucks uh, and being able to interface between uh, you know um, pubs and uh, and bars etc. and be able to provide a new different way of thinking about how you would provide food at your venue. So I think those are the brands that are really clever and that they've got people behind them thinking hard about what consumers want, but also about not just what consumers want, but also what owners of businesses may need. And they're genuine entrepreneurs and they're doing really well. Uh, whereas I think, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the meaningless face of the stuff, which are just here today, gone tomorrow stuff, they will be gone tomorrow. And um, particularly the unsustainable ones, I very much hope that they will be gone. Yeah, and I know you. You, it's one of the things you talked about. If you're not in sustainability or not have a, a, a an outcome that you want to make the the world and the planet a better place, you will probably not be in business in 
in in in five five to seven years i think you said on a another interview but there's a there's a book uh, uh, because you talk about the the brands you talk about here is what you know normally would be called challenger brand there's a book we we have a shared book i listened to another interview with you you adam morgan uh, eating the big fish it's it's a great 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 book it's uh, it's like that combination with uh, one of my other favorites uh good to great because then you understand that that you know uh that marketing is not just a, a discipline in a silo it's actually something that's happening across the organization uh in all elements um but again what 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 is the you know the typical uh attributes just for people out there thinking what what did they mean with a challenger brand what are like, the typical attributes these challenger brand has besides they they're doing good more than just making profit of course they need to make a profit because else there's no engine to do uh to do good but what what, what else is the typical uh attributes they have these brands well, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned the the, the the profit thing because profit's crucial because profit is oxygen. And, you know, absolutely, I don't believe in uh, businesses that, 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 are, that are not sustainable, literally financially sustainable. I think uh, if you're going to run a business, you've got to be able to make it work as a business. And I, and I love businesses that operate out of cash flow and grow out of cash flow without the need for vast amounts of sort of patrons coming along and putting endless amounts of cash in not ever knowing whether it's going to come back um and you mentioned adam morgan um who is a, who is an absolute legend and i think you know he is you, know, you and i clearly have the same library uh his book well worth a read you know has the eight credos which which i won't repeat but you know they're well, i might do actually i mean he he's brilliantly identified the eight behaviors that challenger brands have to sort of adopt really to to, to be able to do what they do which is Ultimately, things like be, I can't even remember, intelligently naive, um, uh, adopt a, a sort of lighthouse mentality. Um, you know, anyway, I won't, I won't go through all of them, but, you know, th- th- those are the sort of things that he talks about in his book. Um, I, I have a, a sort of, I suppose, a, a, my own version of that, which I call startup mentality, because I think that on top of being a challenger brand, you don't necessarily, you know, challenger brands are a very particular type of category. Um, uh, they're a very particular type of business that ultimately are there to challenge, you know, do what they say, challenge the category um, and give the category a kick up their arse. Uh, for me, in order to be able to be a challenger brand or, not, or, or just a, a, an insurgent maverick brand, for example, I think you need to be insurgent i think you need to have a bold mission i think you need to have uh this 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 constant restlessness that you know that that frankly whatever you are wherever you are today it's not good enough and needs to be better tomorrow which sounds exhausting but this idea of relentless pursuit of better is i think a very positive thing in a challenger mindset um i think that you've got to be obsessed with your product and service and be on you know, be on the front line of saying, I'm not sitting here kind of working out my business through management structures and, you know, lots of clever management consultancy techniques. I'm here by about making my business work because I'm listening to customers. I'm obsessed by making my product better. I'm listening to what they have to say and I'm adapting it. Um, You know, I'm building loyalty through providing a great product and a great service. Uh, I've got a team who are you know, absolutely riddled with our values and believe in what we do. And it just sort of oozes in every bit of the business that that this business is means means business and that we are we love what we do and we believe in it. So I think challenger brands, I mean, look, if you need to talk about challenger brands, the best thing is to get Adam on and talk about, you know, the the the, the sort of 10 or 12 different archetypes that he's defined. If you need to talk about um day to day you know what do you wake up in the morning and think i think you think every morning you should think what would i do today if i was to start my business from scratch <laughs> if i could change everything what would i do differently and that's what i kind of try and, and you know say to my team is don't be don't just become um entrenched in We've done that before. It works, so we'll do it again. You know, to constantly ask yourself, but why? I mean, there's a really, really brilliant story that I heard on a podcast the other day about 
I can't, I wish I knew who the guy was actually. I, you know, when you catch these sort of, I was listening to it in the car and I, and it came on the radio, I think, or something. I don't know why, but anyway, and it was a story that I half heard about a fire team, a fire crew. You'll probably have read this book. Um, and it was an excerpt from a book, I think. And it was about some firefighters, I think. And they were, fi- they were fighting a fire and there was a big crew of them. And there was tragedy, tragically uh, lo- loss of life in this story. But the head firemen, when there's this forest fire was happening, they were all trying to run away from it and reach, I think, a ridge where they would escape from the flames of this fire that was moving at an incredible spe- speed. And the chief fireman suddenly, apparently, stopped and instead of running away from the fire, started lighting a fire uh, on the ground. This is crazy. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and this whole team would go, what the bloody hell are you doing? And he started lighting a fire and, and burning all, the, I think, the grass and the shrubs where they were but, and, and then lay down. And, and they were like, what the, what the hell's going on? And, and apparently they all ran off. And this guy survived because what he did was he um, he created a, a fire space that he could lie in, and the fire, the the incredible forest fire, went over him. And he and because the fuel had already been burnt off, and he'd put out the, the flames and lay in the ashes of the fire he'd created, he survived. Uh, and sadly, I think many of the other crew didn't. And I just thought that was a very clever story uh, to to talk about, which was thinking on your feet in a you know in a situation where you know you would counterintuitively do something that absolutely doesn't make sense but of course does make sense because he thought about it and i think i wish i could if anyone's listening to this and they know where that story came from i'm going to try and look it up i couldn't find it i'd love to know because i just thought that was genius because it, it's it, it's exactly the kind of thing that we find in our work that we do which is clients will come in and they go you know we've got a problem you know, the markets go against us or, you know, X, Y, and Z. And and you don't start doing counterintuitive behavior things, whereas founders and entrepreneurs do. They will they will happily rip up their business models and rethink. In fact, uh, Michael, I think you're, you're <laughs> probably exactly the person. He's is, is, is just like the guy in that fire. You know, uh, I, I, you know, that is exactly what you and Jens were talking to me about, which is genius. It's It's rethink your business model if you have to, you know, rethink anything if you have to. It's so interesting because uh, so many are afraid of uh, pulling the the business model apart. And what you know, most entrepreneurs I know, that's actually when they they are allowed to to pull in the business model and question it. Is that where they get most energy? Because then it's a bit like you said, you're back in startup mode. It's like a blank canvas. You can then experiment because that's what the entrepreneur likes to do they are a bit like uh, you know scientists they want to experiment they would and they get the kick out of it getting that light bulb working after ten thousand try you know and that's it that's it's that pursue and then when you've done that you need to go and break something else because of um so i think i think it gives a really good sense what you're saying i love the fireman uh, story i had never heard about that story before I tell you what I'll do. I will go and do some more research because I only heard it yesterday when I was driving up to London, and I I caught a glimpse. I was like, "God, that's such a good story." Um, but actually, but but I think this is also back to Adam's uh, credos. You know, one of his thing is break with the past. You know, challenger brands are happy to break with the past. And I think this is just sort of breaking out that that one behaviour, and, and also a sort of the other thing is that. I personally have always loathed authority. I've, I've always had an aversion to ever since I was at school, you know, people telling me what I should be doing. I, you know, I, I, mean, I do like a constraint, but I, I think a sort of an aversion or a, you know, a suspicion of authority or bureaucracy, certainly, um, is something that I think challenges. They don't, you know, they just don't care what the rules are. I mean, I, I think I, Every entrepreneur I've ever met has completely ignored the contractual terms that we've signed them up to. <laughs> they just, they just don't care, um, and they, and they, they're absolutely obsessed with cash. They're obsessed with getting stuff done. I mean, one of the greats I think of all time is Julian Metcalf. I always talk about Julian and, and Johnny Bowden. Actually, they're sort of similar types of people, but in terms of your world, you know, and and, and Itsu. I, I just love the fact that uh, you know Julian was just totally had no regard for the rules. 
<laughs> and I, I, th- I think you still don't have any, any, any regards for the rules. <laughs> he's so, absolutely uh, brilliant, you know, and, and he's obsessed, absolutely obsessed with his with his business, which is brilliant, you know, because that's what you need. So I think, um, you know, a lot of corporates come to us, big companies, and say, "Can you help us? We are just we're just we can't we we really struggle with innovation. We don't we have you know twenty two layers of decision making. You know, we have all of this stuff." And in fact, I had one a couple of weeks ago, a very large organization, very sweetly sort of rang up and said, "Look, I, I think you can help us because we love this idea of startup mentality. We just don't have it. You know, we send our lives buying businesses that have done things that we've we've talked about but have never done." And I said, well, look, you know, I'd love to help you, but, you know, ultimately, because you're big enough to make a difference, you know, and you're clearly willing to make a change, which is fantastic. And, and I've, I've, I've actively avoided working for large, big corporates only for one reason, not because I don't, you know, it, it's because their cultures just do not allow innovation to happen, which is why they have to acquire innovative businesses. And maybe that's a great ecosystem and that should just continue. But but I think, you know, because they generally, big organizations have what little organizations don't and vice versa. And, you know, big, big fish eat little fish. There you go. Um, but, but I think what's happening now is you look at Unilever and you, and you mentioned McDonald's earlier and, and various companies. These are fascinating organizations that, that honestly I'd love to work with because I think they can make the biggest difference, uh, except... Do, do, you know, will they be able to change? Can they can they be insurgent? Can they adopt a startup mentality? Can they move fast enough? Uh, can they, and our motto being think big, dive deep, swim fast. I, I think I think they can, but they probably need a lot of help. And they changing an organization's culture is probably the hardest thing in the world. Um, hence, yeah, hence why I love love stories like the fire guy, you know, or you know, other stories like that, where you you sort of read books by people like IDEO or Google, and you realize that these organizations are entirely built on a, an attitude in their culture that is enviable. <laughs> they just nurture irreverence and, you know, mavericks, um, and, and they salute them. Is this culture then, uh, Perry, a, a critical component to become a challenger brand? Because, you know, if you, th- if you think about some uh, Patagonia as an, an example outside the, the, the restaurant industry uh, as well, like their culture is really carrying the brand. You have a guy like David Hyatt that has a higher genes, again, very, very built on, on culture and where and, and, and the product as well. There's an obsession about the product uh, as well. Yeah, I, look, one hundred percent. And I, by the way, I'm a massive hypocrite because um, in my own business, uh, you know, I probably struggle to create, you know, a great culture. And there I am dishing out advice to everyone else. And I'm sure if my team listened to this, they'd probably go bloody Perry, such a bullshitter. Um, but I, I, you know, I absolutely, it's crucial. Yeah, you know, without culture, you know, ultimately. If you get take it down to the bare basics, it's very simple. If people behave in a particular way, that's the that's that's what culture is. It's it's how people behave. So if you can encourage the right behaviors, you're going to build a great culture. And that great culture will attract the most fantastic people. Your vibe will attract your your tribe, both to, to work for you, with you. And, you know, your clients, et cetera. So, and those people collaborate to create phenomenal products and services. And, and that's what success is. And so ultimately you are building a, a, a myth, you know, a, a fallacy if you think that you can just start a business and not think about the behaviors. So for example, and I'm struggling, you know, I, I'll be honest, I'm struggling in my own organization over the pandemic to, to really do this brilliantly Maybe I'm just restless about this, but, you know, we have this, we've introduced quarterly coaching sessions Mm. and we have something called an ambition wheel, which is that everybody has to write down what their personal and their, their work ambitions are uh, around a circle and, and try every quarter to, to look at that formally with, you know, with their coach, with their line managers to say, you know, are we helping you? in get, getting there and are you helping us in get, getting where we want to get to uh, is this a mutually beneficial relationship and and to be honest 
people, I think, are kind of like, do I really have to do this quarterly? And I'm like, yes, you do. Come on, guys. You know, because if you don't have a plan and you don't, you know, and you don't keep looking back at the plan, you, you won't get there. So it's not easy. Uh, I think it's the hardest thing in the world to do. And uh, you know, I'm a deluded optimist. Um, and, and I and when it, and when it works, it works really, really well. And I think it is working with some of our team. They're really embracing it. But quite a lot of the team who've been with me for you know a long time are quite rightly questioning everything. You know, that's what we say: question everything. And they, they go, "Well, is this?" Really? And I'm like, "Well, for Christ's sake, can you not question this?" <laughs> um, but no, I think it's culture is everything, and I'm, I feel very lucky that we have. I wake up in the morning and I still enjoy the, the prospect of the day, and I hope that that's where most people get to. I think there are some wonderful people like Simon Sinek who, you know, quite rightly call out bad bosses. And I'm probably a bad boss. Um, but, you know, it says that, you know, people need to work in safe environments, do their best work. And, and I think that the next generation are doing a really good job of calling us dinosaurs out on all of this and saying, look, we want to come to work for not just for the money. We want a great environment. We want fabulous training. We want to learn. And and we want to be in an environment where we feel that every day that we're actually contributing rather than just listening. And, you know, that's really, diff it's very difficult in, a, in an organization to scale that. So, yes, I love David Hyatt and all of those people. I think they are, they are the future, but they're the heroes of, of, of business today. And if their work means that it makes a difference and people's jobs get more exciting and better, then... I love that. I think that's that's fantastic. And I'd love to be, you know, I'd love to be able to help promote that. And and we try and do that. But it, as I said, I'm sounding like a total failure. It's really hard. <laughs> as I guess a bit like a, I see culture and always seen that when I've been running teams and organization, helping people with culture, you need to see it a bit like keeping your body in, in a good health. You know, it's a bit like exercise. You can't do that for one week and then don't, don't do it the rest of your life. <laughs> you need to come back to it. And then I think it's about the atten uh, attention the area gets and you try out things because everybody needs to find their own rhythm or flywheel for culture. And I think that's what people forget sometimes. It's not like just like social media there's a checklist it's like something you need to work with and different people need different things and culture evolves uh, like a good soado base does uh, over years and i think it's about actually having a starting point and actually keep on coming back working with the culture you do it quarterly it's a it's a great thing i think many companies could 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 do that but coming back to that again if we um, take our journey around the challenger brand ended around the culture do you see from, from an outsider, not being part of the hospitality and restaurant industry, do you see any challenger brands exactly that you look at in the, the restaurant saying things? They they are they're doing some interesting stuff. They are they are really ripping up the playbook in a way. Yeah, well, interesting actually. It, it's so my hospitality sort of experience has been periodic. Uh, I suppose the closest business I've ever got to in is in any meaningful way was it to um when i worked with julian for about a year and a half sort of helping him on a monthly basis just but mainly actually with their grocery stuff but but i think it's a, that for me challenged a lot about uh the restaurant was it a hospitality service i think leon is also an incredible uh business that's done a very good job and i think i don't know if you've come across um one fine dine which is a brand by a guy who was in the private jet catering industry and he sort of i think a lot of the businesses that already existed are now are challenging themselves and to, to think again and i think that's kind of fascinating actually funny enough i was talking to charlie buffet uh, who you had on he's a good friend uh and he was talking about i asked him well, what do you think of, what, what are the challenger brands in um in the hospitality industry, and he talked about one which is I'd come across, which was called is it German kebab? Uh, and he was saying he thought that was a really great, great challenger. I thought that I don't know, but it sounded sounded brilliant. But I, I for me, in the answer to the question, you know, have are there great challenger brands in hospitality? I think there, you know, I in the last year I haven't been out, so I don't know really any. I don't know the answer to that. But from what I've seen. The ones that have adopted a really amazing new mindset. I think actually I was talking to Charlie about Breakfast Club, for example, and his 
um, what's his chicken business called? Um, uh, butchies. Butchies. Yeah, I think all of these new businesses that are sort of coming into spaces that you thought might be saturated, uh, they're actually doing interesting new stuff. I think that that's fascinating. I think the bit I'm actually working with, with I can't tell you about it because I'm under NDA, but I'm working, I have been working for the last 18 months uh, on, a, on a challenger in, in hospitality, in a, a potentially global. But I think the interesting thing that's happening in the category is that health, convenience, low staff costs, and the ability to deliver products in places that perhaps you wouldn't imagine, you know, you would be able to find quality food is 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 certainly on the rise. You can look at you look at quick service casual dining. I know Charlie was talking about this, and I agree with him. You know, Charlie, a long chat with him the other day about it, about the fact that casual dining and quick service restaurants are going through a, an epiphany, and that people people are obsessed with convenience, especially now with the change of the way that we work and that we interact. I think there's going to be a really interesting new world out there where, you know, we aren't going to be on the nine to five commute five days a week. We're going to be living quite nomadic lifestyles where we'll probably be, you know, freed from the desks that we were chained to. And who knows? I I, I think it's going to be very exciting to see what happens as we come out of lockdown. Um, with all of the properties that are available, that sadly a lot of them through through businesses going out of business um, thanks to the lockdown, I think it's going to be a sort of phoenix a phoenix phase where amazingly strong businesses will rise and hopefully interesting new ones that are going to challenge some of the capture conventions, whether that's with sustainability or quality or convenience. I think it's interesting, uh, Perry, because I, I agree with uh, the conversation about uh, it's like a blank canvas and you see there's some people coming in and actually going to reinvent how you can be offered food uh, in a way, uh, which we haven't even imagined yet. Uh, and actually how you actually build a, a profitable business from the outset, because the restaurant businesses are in categoric, not very profitable. I haven't been for years. It would be better to put your money in bonds or in a flat, I often say. Why would you even start that business when I look at your P&L? Why would you even start that business? Because you're going to run out of money very soon and it's going to be a drag on your life. Why would you do that? Buy a flat in, in, in London and, and live off the return. That's a bad idea. Um, so, so it's interesting. I think this situation actually we're going to create a, a space for challengers, brand and entrepreneurs that didn't have the opportunity because of resources to launch their idea and test it out and actually how they could serve food in a different way and especially the health thing i think that's spot on as well what's really interesting is the role of food i i for for, for me i think the role of food and conversation is going to become so different so that you know at the moment we i think there's a whole fuel culture of people who don't really even know what they're eating they're just they're just fueling themselves and i think that as the world wakes up to the importance of quality in food and sustainability i hope very much that people will start to value food more food's too cheap i mean you know it's crazy Uh, and i think this goes back to eu subsidies and the fact that we've been subsidizing food insanely for years and You know, you look at really good quality food that is sustainably sourced, you know, eat less, but eat better. It's got to be a mantra. You know, if you, I mean, I mean, I'm not a vegan and I, you know, and I I definitely eat meat, but not a vast amount of it these days. But I do, I do love Michael Pollan's uh, mantra, which is eat food, mostly plants, not too much. I, I think he's spot on because, you know, and I would add eat, eat, Eat quality food. You know, don't eat shit. Uh, tr- you know, value it. You know, treasure it. No, you know, really enjoy it, and take those moments that, you know, where you can connect with people over food. You can cook food and feel good about it. You can feel like you're contributing. And when you're out and when you're working, actually, conversations around and over food are probably the best that we ever have. So I think the whole way that we do business and that we work and that we interact with each other 
there's such an exciting opportunity out there to, to think about the fuel side of food and then the quality side of food and actually to try and improve people's health has got to be you know a number one agenda which is get decent quality food into more people's mouths uh, and help the health of the nation um, and do it sustainably i mean for god's sake it, it, it could be better cheaper and better for everybody <laughs> what's not to love about that the funny thing is that the food that's good for you is uh, often also good for the planet exactly and that's a very very clear link so you can actually as a food business you can make a hit two big uh, problems in the world or on the un uh, goals as well what about uh you know we take 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 you know food and uh, let uh, i would just want to touch a couple of things before we end the conversation because one of my questions i really wanted to ask you because like you know when you talk marketing there's so many views on what marketing is. It's it's boosting out a lot of digital advertising. It's taking a lot of pictures of your product. But what is, in your view, the biggest lie in marketing in every professional area? If it's uh, leadership advice or whatever, that's always the biggest lie. But what is your biggest? The biggest what lie. Do you think the biggest lie in marketing <laughs> in marketing is. Oh God! I mean, that, I think someone asked me that then. I said it was a nightmare question then. Um, I think I think the biggest lie in marketing is, well, I'm going to say it, and I'm always going to get killed for saying this. I think advertising is the biggest lie. Um, look, the point is that the world of advertising has done an incredible disservice <laughs> to people. The biggest lie is spend a load of money on advertising and your business will grow. <laughs> that is the biggest lie. You know, 98% of the stuff that you send out is a total, is a, is wasted. No one listens to it. No one cares. Um, so many people spend money on advertising when they haven't nailed their product. So many people spend money on, on making people aware of something that they're never going to buy. <laughs> you know, they're just not interested in. And what a waste of time that is. And what a waste of money. And what a waste of people's attention that is. I mean, you know... Just to sort of camera, would you walk down the road gratuitously just knocking on every door, ir irrespective of who lives there, and ask someone if they're interested in buying your product? Of course you would. You'd go and walk down the street and look and eye up the house and decide which of those people do you think might be interested in your product. And then you'd probably think of a really nice way of introducing it. Uh, so, yeah, for me, the biggest lie in, in marketing is that is that advertising is the quick fix. And I think that's what's done a great disservice to many of the brands out there today is that um that, that, that advertising has created an unfair unfair share of voice for irrelevant brands that frankly uh has clouded and sort of uh hidden from view some of the most important brands and some of the most important issues funny thing you say the thing about knocking under doors i can say to the audience oh, that works you know yes, find, it does. Your, find your area <laughs> go go and knock on those doors because uh i've been part of a little project uh where actually we did that through the pandemic because people was home you know we thought that's the best way to build a relationship is to turn up on their doorstep some of them will throw you down the stairs but other they will love to have a conversation because they are they've been in in that house for so long they just want to meet another human that comes with some positivity so yeah and and it works really well. Genius. And, and actually, by the way, that is spot on. So it's far better to, to go, because when you knocked on those doors, you probably decided which streets would be the most appropriate. You'd have profiled them. You wouldn't have just randomly done it. And when Fre Freddie's Flowers built their entire business without any advertising, built on knocking on doors of people who we thought um, would want our flowers, wealthy people in affluent areas, frankly. And that's really clever. And it also creates a personal relationship. Uh, and yeah, as you say, a lot of people don't. One good story about that was uh, one of the, because um, Freddie and, and Keith and um, Ted hired, uh, brilliantly hired out of work actors and sort of graduates uh, and sort of, or, or gap years, I think they were, um, gap, gap, people in their gap year to go and do this sales thing um, of knocking on people's doors. And uh, one of my friends, Patrick, his uh, his son, his son uh, knocked on a lady's door on his first day to try to sell us a subscription to Freddie's Flowers, and she turned up, opened the door with marigold, yellow marigold gloves on, and um, <laughs> he, the opening line was, "Yeah, do you like flowers?" And she said, "Yes, I do like flowers, but I'm quite busy." And he said, "Well, I'll tell you what, 
Uh, I can see you're doing the washing up. If I do the washing up, will you subscribe? <laughs> <laughs> so he went in and he did the dishes and she subscribed and became a customer. And I just think that's brilliant. That is really great marketing. That's great marketing, yeah. I agree on that. Um, Perry, before we end off, there's a couple of more things I would like to cover with you. you. You say that you believe that life is too short to settle for second best. What do you mean with that? And uh, how do you keep your own A-game after 27 years? How do you keep innovating? Do you really want to wake up in the morning and settle for second best? I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I, I think that I would far rather, you know, not do something. Uh, I'd rather do something well than than just just do it you know, half-heartedly. And so if you're going to do something, I think commit to it, overcommit to it, and, 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 and give it your best. And so, um, yeah, I think maybe it's a very privileged view um but in the world of business i've chosen to work with the best people i'm very lucky that i've sort of waited out and i think i didn't answer the question you mentioned earlier which is why don't we agree to pitch um and certainly not pitch for free and i think that you know if you want to work with the best people um you've got to you know you've got to put your hand in your pocket and the reason that we don't pitch for free is that the value that we offer is our experience, our cumulative experience over many years. Uh, and we help share that experience by working collaboratively with other clients, which takes a lot of time and investment in diary space. And when people ask you to pitch for free, they generally ask you to second guess what their, what their businesses are. You don't have that opportunity to immerse yourself and really understand their business, their ambition, you know, where the levers for growth are, you know, what the opportunities are, what the roadblocks are. And so they might have told you what those are, but our job is to is to challenge that. And so for me, second best is is just settling for what people say and not being able to interrogate it. So how do I keep my A game? I, I think I'm I'm a corporate pain in the arse. I'm a professional corporate pain in the arse. I like you, I ask lots of questions. <laughs> Quite often they're very difficult ones, and sometimes they're not very pleasant ones. They, they're uncomfortable, um, and so yeah, I think that's what I try and do every day, and I and I, I enjoy being a corporate pain in the ass. So um, sorry again, I haven't really answered the question directly, um, but I think if you wake up every morning with renewed energy and think, you know, what would I do differently today? I've got another chance. I know I made it through last night. I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> I can have a second shot at it. You know, keep pursuing better. That's uh, yeah, that's yeah. how I try uh, to, to live that. It's I call it as well. You, you... <laughs> You need to make a dent every day because why? Why are you here? Else, do do you do your best game every day? So uh, there's 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 one thing because I I I uh, I see you as an entrepreneur as well, uh, Perry, and and it's always great to hear from entrepreneurs here on the show. What is the the biggest failures bit? Because we always talk about the successes and all that because failures normally uh, shapes us uh, as human beings and businesses. So what what is yours? I mean, you'd need an entire series of podcasts to go through my failures um, <laughs> because they are, they are eventually, I mean, there's a very long list of them. But I think you're right. Failures are the way we learn. Mistakes, you know, should be encouraged because if you're not making any mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. I think good old Einstein again said, uh, if you don't, if you don't want to make mistakes and don't do anything new. Um, I think my biggest failures I mean, I mean, there are too many to mention. I think the one that I probably learned the greatest lesson from, lesson from was probably my first major failure as an entrepreneur trying to be a startup guy. So I, I teamed up with this lovely lady uh, to do a fashion business about, I don't know, it must be 15, 16 years ago. Um, and she was great. She walked in and she had, a, she had some really interesting coats and jackets that she made from sort of uh, the ends of t- fabric. Uh, kind of tweed and stuff and she was really really lovely and I thought great you know I can I can get I was involved in fashion businesses at the time and I thought great we can uh, we can start a brand and we can do a really great job and I remember thinking the, my then my business partner at the time a guy called Nick uh, and I sort of did a forecast on this and like Christ you know we could make 200,000 quid EBITDA in year one <laughs> this is really good you know this is mm-hmm. so exciting yeah and I was like very, and, and, and so mistake number one was greed, you know, and impatience on that front of thinking, 
or about the money. And what we lost sight of was that actually that the product needed a, a great deal of attention to detail. And although this lady was lovely, she was great and she was very enthusiastic. She, we hadn't really done our due diligence on the, on the process of making these tailor-made products. So I invested about 80,000 quid of my hard-earned cash, which was more than I'd have earned in that year. <laughs> and I, and I, I didn't really have 80 grand cash spare. Um, and we, I lost a lot in the, in the first year um, because the products kept getting coming back with sort of sleeves, different lengths. And, you know, the product was just not as good as the marketing. And we, you know, it was, it, it did become good. But what we did was we rushed at it. We didn't really focus on the product. And we didn't empower this poor woman who we kind of basically took, we took a large share of her business um, and we just, we messed it all up. We just didn't think about the product. We didn't think about how we were going to scale this business. We didn't think about uh, the detail. And actually we just went in with marketing and we spent all the money on a photo shoot and, and sort of did door to door flyers and actually completely cocked it up. Um, anyway, thankfully, she's now very successful. Uh, we parted company and um, sort of handed it back to her, said, thanks very much, but you're far better at this than us. And so basically, the lesson I learned was, you know, do the things that you know, stick to what you know, and of course, you've got to learn, but don't start trying to, you know, take too big a share in people's businesses, don't try and control them, um, obsess about the product. You know, I learned so many lessons, I can't even, I, I did write them all down, actually. But the number one thing that was important was that we didn't focus on the product enough. Um, and we didn't, and she quite rightly kind of kept saying to us, yes, we need to spend more money on fabric. We need to spend more money on the product. And we didn't, and, and, we, and we messed it up. So yeah, um, pr product is king. Yeah, and, and it's just so interesting. I see that myself when I uh, worked or advised people in, in the past as well, is that, uh, it's about you know the product. A great product is so key to start out with because that's what you're you're selling. First of all, that's your first touch point, and then how you scale that product and how you get the rest of your organization. If you don't have sat down and had some thought about that before you run up and open your doors, if it's a restaurant, then then you're going to get into trouble because you haven't spent enough time on the idea, as David Hyatt says as well. You need to spend enough time on things to really understand. And it doesn't mean you get a perfect plan, but you're more ready to do the right things at the right time when it comes and do the right investments. Um, and I think that that's, that's the key lesson you're talking about here as well. Absolutely. And, and pro pro prototyping is king. So, so I think the thing is, it's very easy for us to sit here and prototype a model and go, oh, we've done a great spreadsheet and we've got a product prototype, et cetera. But the reality is, is that when you're trying to produce 200 jackets a week, you know, and you're trying to measure people's different shapes and sizes, you know, the complexity of that operation is so, it's so complicated that you've got to obsess every last detail and, and, and you've got to have people there who are motivated and willing to obsess um, and so all we did was we, you know, we looked at the margins, got greedy. Thought, oh, well, you know, we can, we can make lots of money on these. And, and you know, that was a long time ago and I would never do that again. I would invest heavily in the product. Uh, I think that happens in, especially in hospitality, this has happened where people have looked at a spreadsheet and say, we can get a hundred of these, the spreadsheets said, but nobody thought about there's a, there's a, there's a lot of million things that need to happen outside that spreadsheet. There's a bit human beings to do, and they are, they are not able to be controlled, as you said earlier as well. Um, uh, great, great learning there. Uh, what, if you had to give a book to anyone uh, and uh, nine out of 10 times, what kind of, what book would that be and why? Okay, so I do have thirty copies of Project Drawdown uh, in my in my house. So, and I keep it topped up. So, everyone, I give everybody Project Drawdown by Paul Hawken because I think it is the bible in terms of how to help fix the climate emergency. So, if anyone hasn't read Project Drawdown, I would heartily recommend it. But even better still, they've got an even uh, even better website now. But the book is still brilliant, um, and he. I don't know if you know it, but it's um, he asked sort of 200 of the world's greatest scientists what the uh, what the single solution was. How could they prioritize the solutions to uh, drawing down carbon? And um, it's it's summed up beautifully in a pie chart, frankly, um, which says, you know, 
all of these initiatives are important. Some are going to make a bigger impact than others. Um, so uh, yeah, that is that is I think the most actionable, brilliant book when it comes to the climate emergency. Um, if you are like I am, you know, very eager to see the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, met, <laughs> achieved, then uh, you need to have some advice on how to do that. And you know that that book shows each category what can be done um, and has initiated, I think, a fantastic movement of, of doers rather than talkers. So, yes, that's the book. That's great because I actually never heard about that book. Oh my god, enough. that's crazy! You know, I, 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 I have all the all the books you talked about. I have them up behind me here. Uh, that's definitely one I need to go and get. I can. Hear. I mean, I will that's send a, you a copy. Good. I will as a present. But I will send it to you. And uh, we will put it up on our on our reading list on our website as well for you guys out there because I think that's one you you need to to read. But. That leads me to to the last question because I could ask you many many more questions, but uh, I'm aware about your time as well. Um, but the last question we always ask the guests, Perry, is that uh, what is your top three advice to leaders out there that want to to accelerate their brand or business? As we've learned in this conversation, brand is actually a business, and it's there's much more to it than than just marketing. But what is your top three advice to to leaders out there right now in the in the context we're in now? Well, I mean, my top sort of macro advice is, is think big, dive deep, uh, swim fast. Those are the three behaviors that you must adopt. I think I think any business needs to do that to, to, to succeed. But uh, with sort of slightly more actionable <laughs> advice, I would be, I, I am obsessed with startup mentality. I think if you even if your business has been around for 500 years, you know, you, you've got to think like a startup um, because... If you don't, you won't innovate and you won't adapt and you'll become like BlackBerry, you know. So uh, that's my first piece of advice is to, is, to, is to always have that startup question in your mind about what would I do differently if I was to start my business today? Because that's a great question to ask yourself. The second one is to, uh, I think, you know, just ignore the naysayers. Uh, there, there are so many naysayers out there. It's very easy. And I've spent my entire life kind of probably listening to too many of them you know people will say that won't work well you know that's for you to prove them wrong and i think so that's the second bit of is is don't be afraid to challenge conventional wisdom um rather like the firefighter (laughs) that kind of that that, that's a key behavior and then my final one is to just obviously obsess over your product like 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 julian metcalf you know he is obsessed and people like him, Johnny Bowden, you know, these kind of guys. And I know they're sort of old school guys who have been around for years, but look at the new players who are coming onto the market who are really obsessed by product. And because they're the ones who are going to take you, take your, take your market share, because they're the ones who are asking, uh, how can I make the consumer's life more rewarding? One of the businesses I work with, uh, which is absolutely extraordinary, is a company called Picnic. In um, in Holland, in Amsterdam, uh, and in London, and 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 they are a sort of insurgent newcomer uh, in the retail space, doing a direct consumer offer, and in, in France, in Germany, and in in the Netherlands, and they are amazing. You know, they obsess about their service, about their product, uh, and they've got this sort of googly mentality and. And, you know, they are challenging all the conventional wisdoms out there. Um, and there's a, a, you know, two guys who, who I know who, who founded it, the three founders, but the two I know well are Joris and Michel. And look at them and, and think, how can I be How can I be more like them? That's what I ask myself quite often. Uh, so, yeah, three things are adopt a startup mentality, ignore the naysayers and um, obsess about your product. Great advice, uh, Perry, and uh, and especially the you know uh, that thing around the obsession uh, about product because I think, especially in food, we we forgot that a bit because I my mom ran restaurants and I can remember she said there's like three things you need to do to run a great restaurant and she learned that when I was fifteen and I had to run these yeah they will be called food trucks today but they're not there were these sausage things we set up in Denmark and we eat these terrible red sausages but that's a that's a different that's conversation I love it <laughs> but, uh, uh, but she said like uh, take care of your people your customers 
and your product, then the rest will follow. And she's so right. She's she, in that sentence. And my mom is not is not a, somebody to sit down and write a book. She's written many of the books that talks about experience and so on. And uh, when you do that, and you uh, and you're obsessed about that, you will get somewhere with it at some point. Absolutely spot on. Well, what a brilliant brilliant woman she is. Clearly. Good, Perry. Thank you so much for for taking the time out to come on and share your your story, but also your insights and strategies and about uh, you know the brands of tomorrow. Uh, I'm I'm really really excited to have this uh, conversation with you today. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I'm very grateful for you to have me, for having me on. And I'm I'm looking forward to you uh, hearing your thoughts on Project Drawdown and uh, of what you think of that book. Yeah, I will definitely come back with that. Power and energy to to, to you, the family and uh, your team uh, as we, we move on. Thanks very much. I look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you so much, Perry, for sharing your insights and wisdoms on how to build Challenger's brand and how leaders need to focus on building businesses that not only make profit, but also have a positive impact on their people, communities and the planet. If you want to get more into how to become a better challenger brand and how to build a brand that actually makes impact you should also tune into our episode number 20 your brand as a promise with cliff etrich as partner at the team if you enjoyed today's conversation please share rate review or subscribe to one of our channels a big thank you to biz simply for supporting us bringing great insights strategies and tools to help the industry thrive not just survive check them out at bizsimply.com or go to their social at BizSimply or BizSimplyHQ. You can also email them directly on advice at BizSimply.com. Also a big thank you to Fina Charlson, who is the show producer and editor from the Podcast Collective. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our community and download free leadership tools at hospitalitymavericks.com. And don't worry, if you didn't get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. Thanks for listening and be maverick.